Rotarians and guests. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Louise Mewton. It's not only a pleasure because Louise is a young woman of outstanding ability whose groundbreaking work is going to have an impact on the future of Australian society, but also because she and her work epitomises what Australian health, Rotary Health is all about. Australian Rotary Health, since it was first established over 30 years ago, has provided over $33 million in funding for research and support into many different areas of health, including rural and indigenous health, and the many diseases affecting Australians today. And if you'd like to donate to Australian Rotary Health and assist with the work that Louise and many other brilliant Australian researchers are doing, please take a moment after lunch and fill out one of the donation envelopes on your table. The research funded by Australian Rotary Health has improved or saved countless lives for people suffering kidney disease, motor neurone disease, spinal injury, diabetes, arthritis, many different cancers, including childhood cancers, and mental illness. And it is mental illness that Australian Rotary Health has focused much of its funding on since the year 2000. Louise's research focuses on the relationship between mental illness and the brain, and in particular the use of brain training games, and is funded by the Bruce Edwards Postdoctoral Fellowship which provides Louise with $75,000 a year for three years. Louise completed her PhD at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre at the University of New South Wales in 2012. And she went on and held the position as a postdoctoral fellow and advisor at the Clinical Research Unit of Anxiety and Depression at St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney. But now she's back working on her fellowship at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre at the University of New South Wales. Her research includes 29 publications and she's a highly sought after presenter at national and international conferences. Rotarians, please join me in welcoming Dr Louise Mewton to the podium. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, and thank you so much for having me. I'll just get my slides up. All right, so there's a lot of information here and some technical information as well, but I don't expect you to remember it all. Um, so I just want to start off by saying how honoured I was to receive the Bruce Edwards Fellowship this year. It's a really exciting time for me embarking on my own research career with the support of Rotary Health. I also really wanted to thank Rotary Health for their phenomenal support of mental health research. Over the past few years, mental health research has been getting less and less funding from government bodies, which is why the support of organisations like Rotary Health is just so important. Um, I work at the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre in Sydney, and at the moment, Rotary Health is funding three postdoctoral fellows, including myself, as well as two PhD students and one major research project there. And that's just in my little centre. So Rotary Health is really making a huge difference to the fantastic research that's being done in my area. I'm really happy to be given the opportunity to, opportunity to come and let you guys know a little bit more about where this funding is going. So my research really focuses on the prevention of mental illness in adolescence. And I'm going to talk today specifically about brain training. So why am I interested in mental illness in adolescence? Well, by the age of 17, nearly half of all adolescents will have had experienced a mental disorder. And that's whether it's an anxiety, mood, substance use, behavioural or conduct disorder. And some of these kids will recover completely. Others will have episodes of mental illness followed by episodes of relative stability. And still others will live with their symptoms every day. And these symptoms can be mild, moderate or severe. 
So there we see about 21% or about one in five adolescents experience a serious mental illness. And that's a mental illness that's accompanied by severe impairment or disability. So we're seeing that the rates of mental disorders in adolescents are really high. What we also know is that most mental illnesses have their onset in uh, the teenage years. So the typical age of onset for most mental disorders is actually before the age of 25. So what we see in that graph there is that impulse control disorders, so that's things like kleptomania, pyromania, and some anxiety disorders, things like separation anxiety and specific phobias, so that's like a fear of spiders or a fear of dogs, they tend to have their onset in early childhood. But everything else, so substance use disorders, all other anxiety disorders, mood disorders including depression, and psychotic disorders including schizophrenia, tend to have their onset in the teenage years. So if we want to be preventing these mental illnesses, we really want to be focusing on the early teenage years before these illnesses have had a real chance to take hold and cause significant harm. So we know that mental illnesses are highly prevalent in adolescents and that they tend to have their onset in teenage years. What we also know is that the adolescent brain is under heavy construction. So until the age of 25, we're seeing massive changes in the adolescent brain. So there's two critical periods of brain development during childhood. The first is at about three years of age, and the second is right throughout adolescence. And what we see just before puberty is a glut of new cells being produced in the brain. We're seeing the brain producing a whole lot of new cells and a whole lot of new connections between these cells. And then after puberty, during adolescence, what we're seeing is a gradual pruning of these cells. So we're actually seeing losses of grey matter in the adolescent brain. So from the ages to thir from 13 to 18, we're seeing a loss of grey matter of about 1% per year. And this pruning of cells is actually working towards making a more efficient brain. It's getting rid of those cells that we don't need and just retaining those ones that are useful. So we've got an image of that pruning process up there. So you see at child's birth, there's a, at child's birth, you've got a few cells, a few connections, but not that much going on. Then at about seven years of age, you've got a whole lot of stuff going on, a whole lot of cells, a whole lot of connections between the cells in the brain. And then at 15 years of age, that last panel, what you're seeing is that pruning process start to occur. So you're seeing less and less brain cells and less and less connections between the cells in the adolescent brain. So you can also see in the coloured illustrations down the bottom there, so the red and the yellow areas are areas of high cell density, whereas the blue and the purple areas are areas of low cell density. And what we're seeing as you move from childhood through to adolescence, through to your 20s, is less and less of that high cell density area, high cell density matter, and more and more of that low cell density matter. So we're seeing this pruning of cells during the adolescent years. And what we're also seeing is this process called myelination, which is the depositing of a fatty sheath around the brain cells and around the connections between the cells. And what this fatty sheath does is make the cells stronger and makes the connections between the cells faster and more efficient. So we've got these two big processes occurring in the adolescent brain. We've got the pruning of cells and we've got myelination. And both of these processes are working together to create a more efficient brain that's more or less fully developed by about the age of 25. So some areas of the brain are under heavier construction uh, than others during adolescence. So one of the big areas under construction is the area here in the frontal cortex. So right here. So the frontal cortex is often referred to as the CEO of the brain. So it's the part responsible for our executive functions. Um, so things like planning, strategy and judgment. So recent research shows that this is the area that really undergoes that pruning process. So you see a whole lot of more cells being produced in the frontal cortex just before puberty, and then after puberty you're really seeing this pruning process occur in the frontal region. We also see big changes here in the corpus callosum, and that's a cable of nerves that actually joins the two hemispheres of your brain together. It's believed to be involved in creativity and problem solving, so it's our creativity centre, 
and it appears to change and grow significantly throughout adolescence. We also see changes here in the midbrain, in the amygdala, and that's the area of the brain that's associated with emotional and automatic gut responses. So it governs things like your fight or flight response. So new imaging studies uh, suggest that teenagers use this more reactive part of the brain rather than their more thinking frontal regions when they're asked to interpret emotional information. And finally, we see changes here in the hind brain. So this is the cerebellum, and that's a part of the brain that's long been thought to be involved with the coordination of muscles and physical movement. So it's our coordination centre. It's also involved in the coordination of our thinking processes. And new research shows that it undergoes dynamic changes during the teenage years. So that's a lot of the technical stuff over. So we're seeing huge developments, huge changes in the adolescent brain. Um, and that's why we see characteristic adolescent behaviours, so that's why we're seeing things like risk-taking, novelty-seeking and emotional outbursts. But it might also be why we're seeing the onset of mental illness during the teenage years. And that's because these late developing areas of the brain are also those areas that have been implicated in mental illness. So this is particularly the case for the frontal cortex. So, that area there, Oops. and the amygdala, I'm not sure how to get there we go, and the amygdala, the area in the centre there. So the amygdala has been associated with anxiety disorders, whereas the frontal cortex has been associated with a whole range of mental illnesses, um, including anxiety disorders, schizophrenia, um, depression, substance use disorders, and ADHD. So that frontal area is really heavily implicated in mental illness. So what do we know? So we know mental illness begins in adolescence. We know that there are certain areas of the brain that are under heavy construction during adolescence. And we also know that mental illness is associated with these same areas of the brain. So the frontal cortex and the amygdala are developing during adolescence. And these are also areas that have been heavily implicated in mental illness. So this got me thinking about how can all this, how can this understanding of the brain help us to inform prevention efforts? Uh, it got me thinking about whether we can make these areas of the brain stronger in adolescence and whether strengthening, strengthening these areas has some effect on adolescent mental illness. So in terms of making the brain stronger, what we know, now know is that the brain is constantly changing right throughout the lifespan. So we've just seen evidence of the internal changes that go on during adolescence, but what we also know is that the brain changes constantly in response to external stimuli, and that's right throughout the lifespan. So we've seen MRI studies that show that the brain changes after doing things like learning to juggle. We also see that the brain changes after studying for exams or after learning a musical instrument. So what these studies are really showing is that repetitive training has an impact on the structure and the function of the human brain. Repetitive change, training changes the brain. And it's through this notion of brain plasticity that we can potentially make the brain stronger. So that's really what these brain training programs take advantage of, this notion of brain plasticity or the ability of the brain to change um, in response to repetitive training. But what sort of impact do these brain training programs have? What is the evidence so far showing us? Well, we know that after doing one of these brain training programs, we see improvements on the tasks that have been trained. Um, so that's probably not very exciting and what you'd expect. But what is a little bit more exciting is that we also see improvements on unrelated tasks. So this here is a picture from the Neuro Racer game. And Neuro Racer is a car racing game, but it's also been specifically designed by researchers to improve multitasking abilities. So what these guys did was to get a group of older adults to play Neuro Racer every day for a month. And then at the end of the month, they tested them and found that they improved on their multitasking ability. 
but they also saw improvements in things like sustaining attention and memory, so on tasks unrelated to those that were being trained on. And recently what we've also seen is that doing one of these brain training programs can lead to improvements in real world behaviours and symptoms of mental illness. So what we've seen is that after doing one of these programs we've seen reductions in risky drinking in people with alcohol use disorders, um, improvements in depressive symptoms and improvements in the employment outcomes in people with schizophrenia. So we're seeing that brain training is potentially a useful treatment strategy. It's good for people who are already suffering from symptoms of mental illness. And this idea of changing the brain circuitry as a means of alleviating psychiatric symptoms isn't new. So medications, things like antidepressants, work by changing chemicals in the brain. Um, psychotherapies, so things like cognitive behavioural therapy, work by changing the connections in the brain. So our existing effective psychiatric treatments work at least in some part by their action on the brain. But what about in kids who aren't yet experiencing significant symptoms of mental illness? Can brain training be used as a prevention strategy in kids who are at risk for developing a mental illness, but before a mental illness has had a chance to cause significant social, occupational and educational harm? Well, one small study has looked at this, a small pilot study of kids in the United States. And what these guys did was to get 15 adolescents, they were all aged about 13 years, and they were all experiencing social, emotional and behavioural problems that put them at high risk for developing a mental illness. Um, they split these 15 adolescents into two groups. Um, seven of the kids did a brain training intervention. And so that was 30 to 40 minute battery of brain training, brain training tasks, five days a week for five weeks. So there's some pretty intensive brain training there. Um, the other eight adolescents were just a no contact control group. So that means for the five weeks, the experimenters had no contact with those other eight adolescents. And then what they did at the end of the study was to compare those two groups. And what they saw is that compared to the control group, the training group showed improvements in inhibition, test anxiety, IQ, as well as teacher reported behavior, attention, and emotional symptoms. So what this study was showing is that brain training could be a viable prevention strategy for kids who are at risk for developing a mental illness. Um, there are some problems with the study. The sample size is obviously small um, and the use of a no contact control group is problematic as a comparison here. So what Rotary funding is allowing me to do is to go and replicate this study but on a much larger scale. So what I will be doing is recruiting 220 adolescents all aged around 16 to 17 years and all at risk for developing a mental illness. And I'll be splitting these 220 kids into two different groups. So the first group will be the intervention group and they'll get a, a brain training program that consists of lumosity tasks, and these tasks will focus on executive functioning. So they'll really focus on building the frontal lobes of the brain, that area of the brain that's been implicated in a whole range of mental illnesses. The active control group, on the other hand, will also get a brain training program, and it'll also be based on lumosity tasks, but these tasks will focus on things other than executive functioning. So things like general knowledge, for example, it'll focus on building areas of the brain that haven't been so heavily implicated in mental illness. Uh, so both programs, both brain training programs will be delivered over the internet. Uh, the kids will, I'll have no contact with any of the kids throughout the study. And this sort of thing is really important if we want to develop prevention strategies that are able to be delivered to anyone, anywhere, and at any time. So I'll follow these 220 kids up over 12 months and I'll be assessing them and looking at things like executive functioning just to make sure we are growing the frontal lobes in those people in the intervention group. Um, and I'll also be looking at things like personality and symptoms of mental illness. So at the end of the study, we'll have a really good idea about whether brain training is a useful prevention strategy for kids who are at risk for developing a mental illness.
So finally, what I've got here is just some pictures from the Lumosity, um, the, the Lumosity program. Um, and these are examples of some of the games that will be in my brain training programs. And I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with Lumosity, but it's fun and engaging and not really what you'd expect from a mental health intervention. Um, this is just a first step in an evolving program of research for me. What I think is really exciting about brain training is the fact that it has the ability to be delivered on a really large scale and at relatively low cost. And that's because it's computerised and it's delivered over the internet. So ultimately what I would like to do is build my own brain training program that doesn't have any commercial limitations. So it can be administered on a really large scale um, without any of those commercial limitations that are associated with things like the Lumosity program. Um, but first, we just need to make sure that it is actually a useful prevention strategy in this context. And I mean, at the moment, I'm just focusing on building my study website and recruiting my 220 adolescents. This is for somewhere off in the future. So finally, I just really wanted to thank you for making my research possible. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Would anyone, yes? <laughs> it happens faster in girls, um, and that's probably about the extent of my knowledge of sex differences in this. Uh, but I believe there are, yeah, and I believe it's that it happens quicker, faster in girls and, and at a younger age. But, I mean, so does puberty, so, yeah, yeah. Yep, uh, so I'll be using, it's a scale called the Substance Use Risk Profile Scale. Um, and it's good for identifying kids who are at risk for developing substance use disorders, but also for identifying kids who are at risk for developing anxiety and depression. So it's a um, personality-based targeted intervention program. So we'll be basing kids based on their personality type. So kids high in anxiety sensitivity, and emotional ability and stuff like that. George? Uh, I think one of the one of the cautionary notes around this is that a lot of the research isn't isn't great so we're hearing a lot of positives but we're seeing so like with the example I gave of the small pilot study we're hearing about how I mean comparing them to a no contact control group this this group of kids who got follow up and all this attention it's you know com like comparing apples and oranges so the research around this isn't great um, so that would be one of the sort of cautionary notes and it's just, it really is just still a developing science. I think there needs to be a lot, of, lot more careful research around it done. Yeah. John? Uh, lovely talk, thank you. Thank uh, you. How do you separate um, the environmental um, pressure on towards mental health problems, bearing in mind the number of broken marriages there yeah. are and the use of you know, unemployment moving around? How do you separate that from what from the results that you're following. And the second question is, can, can treatment which you provide kids who are showing signs of mental breakdown withstand the pressures at home from, from, um, uh, uh, from physical abuse, abuse and abusive marriage and abusive kids? 
In terms of separating out the effects, I will be measuring a whole lot of stuff and controlling for that when I look at it. Um, but th that's a pretty difficult task um, to you know do that comprehensively. Um, this is just one sort of aspect of prevention. I'm involved, you know, one approach to prevention. I'm involved in a whole lot of different um, prevention programs, and some of them are based on things like cognitive behavioural therapy and stuff like that. So about changing the way that you think about things. So ultimately, what I would like is for this sort of thing to be to complement those other programs that do focus on more of the social aspects of, of mental illness and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it's just one approach to prevention, but yeah, there are others and I'm involved in those as well. One more, Tom. Sorry. I'm, so I'm, them into geniuses. If they put their children through one of those, they can just do it themselves. There would be pressure, there would be commercial pressure once this system is developed that some parents may latch on to, believing that it will turn their children into something more special than they would otherwise be brain-wise. Yes, and I think there is some evidence, I mean, it's not great yet either, to show that it does improve your <laughs> mental abilities, um, but we need more evidence around that. Um, and I think that is a problem with commercial programs at the moment is that they are touted as a panacea for a whole range of different illnesses and, and for a whole lot of different problems, whereas there's not really evidence there to say that. And I, I don't know if, I mean, without the research there, I don't, I, they, they can't really, and if, if the research does show, is done and conducted well and shows that it is, effective in improving mental abilities and I don't see the problem really in people using them in that way. Um, I think we'll wrap it up there. I'm sure, Louise, you'll be available straight after the meeting. If anyone wishes to talk with Louise later, I'm sure she'll stick around for another five minutes perhaps to talk with you. But in the meantime, it's been a really illuminating subject and I personally enjoyed it very much, Louise. Thank you. It's great to see young women out there doing this kind of research and also benefiting from Rotary. Please uh, join me in thanking Louise and please accept this as our gift. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. It's really been an honour. Thank you.